Okay. Good, good afternoon. I, I want to welcome all of you to the uh, second annual uh, Buxbaum Institute Symposium. Uh, my name is Mark Siegler. Uh, I'm honored to be the uh, executive director uh, of the Buxbaum Institute. The associate director is here with me today, uh, Matt, Matt Sorrentino. Matt, raise your hand. Uh, and our executive administrator is Angela Pace Moody, who puts all the programs together. So thank you to both of you. Um, the Buxbaum Institute was founded 21 months ago uh, with a, an endowment gift from the uh, Matthew and Carolyn Buxbaum Family, Family Foundation an endowment gift of $42 million. Uh, Mrs. K. Buxbaum, uh, the founder of the Buxbaum Institute, is with us today, uh, along with John Buxbaum, a University of Chicago medicine trustee. Please welcome them for us. <laughs> also in the audience are members of the Buxbaum Institute Advisory Board, uh, Dr. Arthur Rubenstein, who for many years was chair of medicine here at the University of Chicago, and then for many years thereafter was the dean and vice president of the University of Pennsylvania uh, Health System. Uh, Laura Roberts, a graduate of this medical school. Uh, we were just looking at Laura's picture from the class of 1988. Uh, and Laura is now the uh, chair of psychiatry at Stanford University. Holly Humphrey, who everybody knows is the dean of the medical school, and um, uh, Matt Sorrentino. So um, it's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, the mission of the Buxbaum Institute is shown on the first slide. Um, uh, our goal is to um, improve patient care, strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, enhance communication and decision-making between patients and physicians, and to encourage uh, interdisciplinary studies um, in, in this area uh, of medicine. Um, uh, in, in, the, in its first year and a half of operation, um, the, the Institute uh, has done some of the following things. We've appointed six uh, wonderful student scholars, three of whom will be presenting uh, their work today. We've uh, appointed four junior faculty scholars uh, the most recent two will be presenting today. We've, present, we've uh, uh, appointed 30 associate junior faculty scholars, along with 24 senior physician scholars and two master clinicians. We've also launched a pilot grant program for our associate junior faculty scholars and have developed an annual lecture and seminar series. Uh, Dr. Humphrey and I have recently designed a new fourth year uh, elective uh, for Pritzker medical students. Um, and at the undergraduate level of the college, we've created uh, what we think is the first such uh, program, a clinical excellence track uh, in the university's uh, undergraduate program. Um, and that, that will be launched in the coming year uh, with, with the new um, entering college students. Um, I just show you some of our programming for next year. Uh, John Lantos will come back to the university uh, to give several talks on challenges to the doctor-patient relationship. Beth Laun, who runs the National Schwartz Center program from Harvard, will be here on December 5th. Robert Smith from uh, Michigan uh, will be talking to us about the biopsychosocial model of care. Um, and Dr. Wendy Levinson, who had formerly had been the um, uh, head of general medicine at the university and now is the chair of medicine at Toronto, will be talking about doctor-patient communication. In addition to these four names that I show you, we'll also be um, sponsoring talks by David Axelrod, uh, Mark McClellan, the former head of um, uh, the, the Medicare Medicaid program, um, Ken Polanski, our, our dean, um, and Nancy Ann DeParle, uh, who helped write the health care reform bill from the White House. So we'll have quite a, an extensive series next year of, of public presentations. Um, today, we, we're delighted that uh, the program will look something like this. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Jerome Lowenstein. I'll introduce Dr. Lowenstein in a moment. Our second speaker will be Dr. Arnold Gold. Um, 
from Columbia University and the Gold Humanism Foundation. We then will award the prizes to the Pritzker Poetry Competition, and then we will hear presentations, uh, research presentations by Institute scholars. Um, and finally, at 4.30 to 5, uh, we hope to have an advisory board panel discussion uh, about the, the Buxbaum Institute and its work. Uh, let me start then with uh, introducing you to uh, Dr. Jerry Lowenstein. Um, Dr. Lowenstein um, is professor of medicine and the Edward C. Franklin firm chief, as well as the director of the program for humanistic medicine at New York University School of Medicine. Dr. Lowenstein is a distinguished physician scientist, as well as an accomplished medical humanist and a prolific author. In 1979, he started the program uh, for humanistic aspects of medical education at NYU and used his experiences with that program uh, to write his first book called The Midnight Meal and other essays about doctors, patients, and medicine. Um, the Midnight Meal referring uh, to the time that house staff were in the hospital at midnight and at NYU they would serve a fourth meal of the day to those house staff who were on call, um, reminding me of uh, my days at midnight in the hospital um, when we, they did not serve us meals. <laughs> but it's an idea that we might implement. Uh, and um, the, the book was published, the, the, the Midnight Meal book was published by Yale in 1997 and republished by the University of Michigan in 2005. Um, uh, Dr. Lowenstein also became the founding editor of the Bellevue Literary Review and founded the Bellevue Literary Press in 2005. Complementing his literary activities, uh, doc Dr. Lowenstein is a senior nephrologist who continues to maintain a busy clinical practice and a full teaching commitment. Today, as the slide shows, Dr. Lowenstein will speak on shifting paradigms, the oldest art became the youngest science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Lowenstein. Uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. Actually, I'm enormously honored to be asked to have been asked to give this talk um, because, I, from what I've seen and what I've learned in the last day, the Buxbaum Institute is really devoted to something which I think is very much needed in medicine today. Uh, it's a program that really deals with trying to teach people about humanistic medicine. And I think if you look around the country, there are a lot of things with the words humanism and medicine uh, to, in juxtaposition, but none of them seem as uh, carefully thought out and devoted to that uh, uh, task as what I see in the Buxbaum Institute. It's really a, a pleasure to be invited. And actually, I feel a little bit like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle. I think you've thought about most of the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but since I didn't know everything that I know now, and I had these slides, I thought I'd show them to you. <laughs> so uh, the title of the talk was to be the Shifting Paradigms. And the subtitle was, be, was to be a, a line from Dr. Th Lewis Thomas's book, um, one of his books. Uh, and the subtitle of that essay was, uh, The Oldest Art Becomes the Youngest Science. Uh, and I think that really describes a paradigm shift. And I think that the notion of a paradigm shift has a lot to say to us today. And that's what I want to sort of deal with and, and tease out. Um, as I say, most of this is going to be known to many of you. OK. Just have to point the, the, that one. That one. Okay. So, a question of definitions. What's a paradigm? There are lots of different definitions, and the one that I like best that fits <clears throat> best with what I'm going to talk about is that a paradigm can be thought of as a set of assumptions, concepts, values, and practices that constitutes a way of viewing reality for the community that shares them, and in this case, especially in an intellectual discipline. So that's what I'm going to be dealing with. We, as a, as a medical society, have a certain meaning that we attach to this term paradigm. And I'm going to talk about some of the paradigms that we live with. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, 50 years ago, myocardial infarction was treated with bed rest. Heart failure was treated with digoxin and mercurohydrin. Hypertension was treated with a rice diet. Arthritis was treated with high-dose aspirin or, or gold injections. Peptic ulcer was treated with milk and alkali. And 40 to 50 million U.S. citizens lacked ad adequate medical care. It's before Medicare. This is the way it was when I finished medical school, which is about 50 years ago. Um, and so there's been a striking change. In the 50 years, and the, more or less 50, 60 years since the landmark discovery of the genetic code by Watson and Crick, has been what I've termed, and a lot of other people have called, a biomolecular revolution. Uh, that involved a whole new discipline of cell and molecular biology, molecular genetics, and with that have come new understanding of diseases, new treatments, and powerful new diagnostic modalities. I think clearly this is, could be called a paradigm shift. If, I think I'm going to skip one. Okay. Lewis Thomas was the um, dean at NYU Medical School and also the chairman of medicine. He was chair of medicine when I was a resident. Uh, and I think he's probably the outstanding medical essayist of the 20th century by a long shot. Uh, this book, Notes of a Bio Medicine Watcher, is not his most famous book, which was Lives of a Cell. And I tell every medical student that I see that that's a book they must read. It's still in print. It's in paperback. It's a brilliant set of short essays that were originally published in the New England Journal and then pulled together as a book, and they're wonderful. And Dr. Thomas wrote, if I were a medical student or an intern just getting ready to begin, I would be apprehensive that my real job, caring for sick people, might soon be taken away, leaving me with a quite different occupation of looking after machines. I would be trying to figure out ways to keep this from happening. So that was written in 1983, so it's 30 years ago. What Dr. Thomas probably didn't envision when he wrote that, that a time would come when medicine would be seen not so much as caring for sick people, but as an industry, this is going to sound sort of uh, harsh, but I think it's true, an industry populated by suppliers and consumers, a, med a major threat to the U.S. and world economy, a fertile territory for healthcare experts and electronic records wonks, and as a field in which an MBA would be of great value. I think that's what's happened in the 30 years since Dr. Thomas wrote his uh, previous piece. So I began to thinking about, about uh, paradigm shifts. And just fortuitously, I stumbled upon a book by Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond is, a, is really a, an outstanding anthropologist. And um, he's best known for his book uh, called Guns, uh, Germs, and Steel. But this book caught my eye. It was called The World Until Yesterday. And what he does, in the, he's done a lot of work in uh, Papua New Guinea. So his book starts with a description of being in the airport in Papua New Guinea. And he talks about, uh, but he doesn't tell you where he is. He describes the airport. It's got scanners and electronic devices and computers and all kinds of modern equipment. And he said, you would think that maybe this is on my way to, to uh, New Guinea. But in fact, this is the airport in Papua New Guinea now. He said he'd been going to Papua New Guinea for over 50 years. And in those 50 years, it had changed so radically that the first times he went there, everyone in there was barefoot. There were no electronic gadgets. Everyone knew each other. They knew each other by name. They spoke the same language. And in the 50 or 60 years that he'd been going to Papua New Guinea, there'd been radical changes. And it's about the same time interval that I'm talking about now between 50 years ago and the present. So I took this as a model for what a paradigm shift can do if looked at from the outside. It's easier to see it sometimes from the outside than from the inside as a physician. So uh, Diamond uh, talks about uh, societies. He describes them as bands, which are usually a couple of dozen people, uh, larger groups called tribes, which would be maybe 100 or 200 people, chiefdoms, which were even larger, thousands of people, and states, which are the, all, includes all the rest of societies. And what he talks about is that in the evolution, in the stepwise increase from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states, 
uh, there are increasing degrees of specialization and a separation of suppliers and consumers. And I thought that was a perfect description of what has happened in medicine today. As we've become more and more sophisticated, more electronically motivated, more electronic medical records, more group kinds of medicine, where one physician may treat 50 or 60 patients at home using a computer to keep records, that there's been an increasing separation of doctors and patients. And with that come a lot of problems. And I think Jared Diamond describes that in terms of societies. And I think it's probably true in the medical society, as I see it as, as well. So Dr. Siegler, uh, I know, has described the mission of the Buxbaum Institute as an ambitious effort to put compassion and empathy on the same pedestal as science and technology. I couldn't help but copy that phrase because it's really very apt. So what's that picture doing underneath? Well, that's a, a drawing that you probably recognize by Picasso. Uh, and this, the special thing about it is that Picasso was able to see this face head on and in profile at the same time. To hold those two images together requires a certain amount of genius. And clearly, Picasso is that kind of a genius. Now, we may not be geniuses, but I think the task that we have today is not to either choose scientific medicine or humanistic medicine, but to merge them, much as, as Mark has said in that short statement that I copied. So that's what I think is our task. So it was easy in the past. The great 18th century physicians lived in hospitals and the homes of the patients that they studied, just as Oliver Sacks did several years ago when he lived with the patients in the Beth, uh, Beth Abraham nursing home in the Bronx. That was the place where he first tried uh, uh, to treat uh, Parkinsonism with L-DOPA, and he, it led to the dramatic findings that were published as Awakenings, the movie, and so on. Uh, but he lived in that nursing home. He was a failed neurology investigator. He almost contaminated the entire laboratory at Einstein College of Medicine. And so they formed him out to Beth Abraham home. And he lived there. And he saw these patients day by day in a way that physicians in their offices rarely get to see patients and know them. Those like Mark Siegler and others that I know get to know their patients, but it's stretched out over years. And we don't quite live with our patients, but Sachs did. And um, I heard him speak at NYU just the other day, and he's continued his kind of brilliant, uh, insightful way of talking to patients and finding out their strengths, not their, their disabilities. I referred a patient to him who had had a, a glioblastoma and lost uh, the ability to, to read completely, a very intelligent, educated woman. And uh, he saw her. I thought she'd be the sort of patient that he would be familiar with. And what he did was not to describe her disability, but to focus on her abilities, the things she could do. And one thing that struck me was he said, you know, there's a larger area of the brain devoted to gesture and mime than there is to speech. And he said to this woman, you're an actress and a mime, so use your hands. Use those strengths that you have. She walked out of there. She said, this is so totally different from the neurologist that I saw at Bellevue, you cannot believe it. That's the special thing about being close to your patients. We can't always do it. So rather than choose scientific medicine or humanistic medicine, what I've thought to do, rather than just grouse and complain, is to try to identify those parts of medicine that we, we want to preserve or recapture, uh, the critical components of the relationships in medicine between colleagues and physicians and patients that we need to preserve, to find those parts of the medicine that many of us who've lived it for many years value most and try to preserve that part. Other things will change. Uh, I guess in the 17th and 18th century, physicians uh, knew their patients very, very well. Some very famous <coughs> physicians were very close to very famous musicians. Um, and so they would have concerts performed live in their living rooms. Um, that, we can't, most of us can't do that today, but uh, it's possible to enjoy good music in the company of friends, and it doesn't have to be live. And I think we can capture some of the relationships between patients and physicians and doctors and doctors 
uh, if, we, if we focus on them and, and value them. So my new ch concerns when we talk about this paradigm shift, my two things that I would isolate uh, is I'm worried about the loss of patient narrative and I'm, loss about the, I'm unhappy about the loss of contact between patients and physicians and among physicians. And so what I've tried to do is to think of ways that one might preserve those two pillars of what I think are critical in good humanistic medicine. So what's the, what's the problem? Well, we've got this in, with, with advanced medicine and uh, all the new techniques that are available, uh, electronic medical records and incredible techniques have evolved. And there's this thing that you may know about as natural language processing, NLP, which is geared to translate text from what they call one human language to another. In fact, what they, this, these programs do is they can strip out of a narrative the keywords that are used for either billing purposes, coding, creating databases, but they strip away the parts that seem to be personal, idiosyncratic, and special. And the things that are personal, idiosyncratic, and special are what really, really allow the relationship between patients and doctors. You take that away, and what you're left with are metrics and numbers, and that really frightens me. So I think there is still a language that's shared by physicians, patients, and medical students, and that language is called narrative. It's the patient's understanding of the sequence and the experience of having lived with an illness. Every patient tells a story. When you ask them how they're feeling, what comes out is not numbers usually, although some patients have been taught to say it's four out of six or four out of 10 pain. But in fact, mostly when you say, how are you feeling, you get a story. Several people have commented on this. Uh, Larry Churchill wrote several years ago, human beings understand their experiences in and through the telling and hearing of stories. Stories are devices which bind agents and events into some intelligible pattern. They weld actors to their actions and doers to their deeds. I think there's a lot of truth in that. This is a quote I picked up from Cliff Cleveland, who's an internist in Tennessee. He wrote a wonderful book called Sacred Space. He says, I take in my patient's stories, sometimes sequentially, sometimes in scattered, almost random segments. This story defines an immediate illness or problem, not as some isolated calamity, but as a part of a continuity of experience. And this goes to the question of how much you can let a patient tell you how long the narrative can be if you're t practicing medicine. And what he does, I think, is to say, you don't have to get it all at once. You have a relationship, and that's that narrative that understanding of a patient's life is continually evolving and building up and becoming stronger. And that's what creates some of that relationship. So narrative is, is a thing that I've really become uh, very much focused on. So the question is, what do these things have in common? The Gilgamesh, the Torah, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Veda, all of those things are narratives. They're all designed to teach, and it goes back thousands and thousands of years. They're not given as lists. I mean, there are 10 commandments, but in fact, most of the teaching that society has depended upon over these many, many years depends on narrative. So it got me to thinking that there must be something special about narrative, why storytelling is so central you know, uh, Noam Chomsky uh, uh, wrote that he thought there was a part of the brain that was hardwired to process language in terms of syntax. Every language, no matter how different, has a syntax. They all have that uh, modality that helps translate to use language. <coughs> and he actually thought it was hardwired into the brain, the way other things are. And I've wondered whether the, the ability to understand and to learn uh, might be hardwired to accept information only when it's present, presented as narrative. So it seems like a wild idea, and I have a lot of wild ideas. And sometimes if I think about them long enough, I recognize that they're not so wild. So it occurred to me after talking about this and thinking about this for some time, 
that there's a model for this kind of hardwiring for accepting narrative as a way of learning. And that's called the uh, immune system. So we have cells that are designed to produce antibodies or um, other immune reactants. And those cells in the immune system are programmed in such a way that the foreign material that they respond to, whether it's bacterial, viral, or other chemicals, those immune cells only respond when the antigen or the substance is presented to the immune cell in the context of an of antigen presenting cell. So inflammation has to be presented to these lymphocytes in a specific form, otherwise the lymphocyte doesn't respond. And I have this idea, which is probably wrong, but maybe right, that our brains are hardwired and have been for thousands of years to learn only when the material that we're faced with is presented as a story. And I think that may explain why stories are so abundant from the deep, great history and you know, documents that have gone back thousands of years to the stories that patients tell when they walk into a doctor's office. So that's my whole business about narrative uh, and the importance of that. I want to shift grounds now. Uh, Dr. Siegler mentioned uh, the midnight meal, so I have to give you a little bit of background. Uh, so I, I did all my training at Bellevue. And uh, I finished the medical school in 1957. Uh, I was a resident uh, starting in 1960. I was away for three years in between. I was in the NIH. And when I came back, uh, the policy at NYU, and this is Bellevue Hospital mostly, because the university hospital was very small. Most of my training was at Bellevue. Bellevue is a municipal hospital. It's a real down and dirty place. Um, and you were on either every second night or every third night. And the nights that you were on, you were on, for example, Monday morning till Tuesday night. So you were there through the night. They had rooms for residents to sleep in. Uh, and the hospital served breakfast, lunch, and dinner for everybody. But there was a midnight meal for the, uh, for the house staff that were on overnight. Usually not attendings, but just house staff. Um, in this down and dirty place, it was served in the basement, and it was served on white tablecloths, and there was a cadre of wonderful Irish women who waited on you, and they would serve you the leftover food of the day. And it was a time when interns and residents, and occasionally an attending would show up. Uh, and I remember being in many of those. And years later, I realized that the function of this was not nutrition, not nutrition of the body. It was really nutrition of the brain. It was a time when people could communicate across uh, lines between medicine and surgery, between younger people and older people. It was a time when you could say what was really bothering you that day, what terrible thing happened, or you could talk. There was a lot of black humor. People told s stories that they would never tell in another place. But in this specialized environment, people could communicate. So that that midnight meal has disappeared. Uh, nobody's on over, overnight. The people who are on there at night are not there during the day. Nobody eats meals. The dining room, uh, I still see it. It's still in the basement of Bellevue, but it's a, it's, a, it's a storehouse for cobwebs and old iron lungs and things. Um, but the days of the midnight meal have disappeared. So coming, flashing forward a little bit uh, and addressing the question about what to preserve, I realized that we have to encourage, we have to find a way for people in medicine, students and their teachers, to talk to one another. So um, I won't give you the whole background, but in 1979, uh, it occurred to me that we should have small group meetings where medical students, interns, residents, and sometimes even their attendings could talk together without a, a specific agenda, uh, in a, in a very uh, limited one-hour session. Um, I was prompted to, to do this by my wife, who said that uh, she saw interns and residents coming to our house for dinner. And that she saw that they, they were suffering from the fact that they couldn't communicate. They were holding everything in. And my wife is very persuasive. So she got me to, to go to Saul Farber, who was the chief of medicine and my great guru, and uh, to propose to him that we start a program where medical students could sit around a table once a week and talk for an hour about anything they wanted. No agenda, no reading list, no evaluations. 
All I needed was a facilitator for this group, someone who was a good listener and could uh, allow conversation to go on. Dr. Farber had his doubts, but he listened to me and ultimately he, let me, he gave me a place in, on the, uh, the curriculum for third year students. A few years later, he sent one, a new member of the Board of Trustees to me to hear about the program, and I wound up with an endowed program. So we've been doing this now for 30 years. Every student who goes to the third year medicine participates in this program in groups of eight to 10 students. And I guess at this point, we've probably had half a million students pass through the program. And in the beginning, because I was uh, who I am, I was afraid that the students would, sit, would blow it off. Medical students are very smart. They know where to put their energies. If they're gonna be in a program which is not evaluated, where they're anonymous practically, they're gonna blow it off. They have other things to do for which they're gonna be evaluated and judged. So I decided I had to show up myself. So I said, if I'm busy and if I can be there, then I think you have to be there. And that's what happened. From the very first session, it took off. And it was, there were wonderful, marvelous discussions. Ultimately, a lot of the thoughts that came up reverberated or rem reminded me of my own experiences and led to the series of essays that appear in this book called The Midnight Meal. Uh, but the important thing was that I think it really generated a kind of um, positive, uh, cohesive feeling that students really appreciate. So having done that, um, created that program, uh, I, I have here the, the statement that the, the Midnight Meal, which is the title we gave the book, um, Midnight Meal consisted of the day's leftovers. The real fair was the day's medical leftovers and the thoughts and feelings that needed to be expressed. So early on, I remember, one of the um, sessions, one of the students who, in fact, at this point is an attending on the ward on my firm, so it's been a lot of years later, and he said to the group leader, uh, Aaron, uh, are you trying to teach us compassion? Um, actually, I don't have it here, but the, the group leader, being very skilled, said, turned it around. He said, I, I'm not going to answer that, but do you think we can teach compassion? And the student said, I don't know if you can teach compassion, but you certainly seem to be able to teach the opposite. That was a, a, a shocking remark. And it really brought everyone up tight. Um, so in my mind, I don't think there's any question whether we can teach compassion. The more important question is whether we, well, whether we will try to teach compassion, whether we recognize the importance of such teaching, whether we accorded the priority in our teaching, and whether those with greater interest and ability for such teaching will be respected and rewarded. I wrote this before I heard a lot more about the Buxbaum Institute, and here it is. I mean, this is exactly what you're doing. You're, you're creating people who value this kind of relationship, and I think that's remarkable. So I have a confession now. I'm, I'm going to give a little personal narrative. I, uh, for the, uh, even as we were starting the uh, humanistic medicine uh, conferences, and I attended many of them, I would go on service on medicine uh, every year. Um, I saw myself as a kind of uh, hard-nosed, physiology-oriented person. I'm a nephrologist. I know about renal hemodynamics. I know about acid-base balance. I know that kind of stuff. Um, and that's what I, I have really rigorous, uh, physiologically oriented morning rounds with house staff. Uh, in the afternoon, I would very often be sitting at this session, I'd be like a different person. I didn't put the morning and the afternoon sessions together. Why didn't I do that? I have to confess. I always thought that some of the older attendings with gray or white hair who would tell stories on rounds did that because they didn't know renal hemodynamics and acid-based physiology. And I was afraid to be seen as sort of a doddering old guy. Honest. So one morning, uh, round started, and the resident said, um, uh, I'm going to present the story of this 56-year-old uh, African-American homeless man. And without thinking about it, I said, what do you mean by homeless? And he said, um, undomiciled. 
I said, no, I know what homeless means. Now, why was he undomiciled or homeless? And he sort of, st I didn't think he'd know. But in fact, he was a good resident. And he stopped, or an intern, and he stopped. He said, wait a minute, I thought about that when I interviewed him. I, I, yeah, he was living on the street because he had just come from California. Um, and he had no place to stay. I said, really? I said, why did he come here from California? He said, uh, oh, let me, oh. Um, he's uh, an actor, and he was out of work. And so he came east to, to look for some job. And he, he hadn't found anything. He was living on the street. I said, do you know anything more? He told me his, his oxygen saturation and what his chest findings were like. I said, let's go see the man. So we went to the bedside, and uh, I introduced myself. I said, uh, um, I understand that you've had a, a hard time lately. He said, boy, have I. I said, I'm here in New York, and I have no place to stay. I was sleeping on the street. I said, why are you sleeping on the street? He said, because I came here looking for work. I couldn't find it. I said, what kind of work have you done? He said, I'm an actor. I said, uh, then I really figured I'm, I'm getting into this. I said, have I ever, would I know what you acted in? He said, I did movies. I said, Do I, would I know one of them? So he said, well, did you ever see Clute? the movie with Jane Fonda? I hadn't, but a number of the house staff had. He said, you know that scene where Jane Fonda walks into this bar and this man comes up to her and he tries to dance with her? He said, that was me. Wow. So then we examined his chest and decided that he had pneumocystis pneumonia. And uh, over the next week or so, um, well, actually, the next day, the resident came in with a, with a uh, uh, the video of, of Clute. He said, that's our patient. So he had a name. And over the course of the next week or 10 days, his course was terrible, and he died. But the house staff knew him as a person. And the experience, which otherwise would have been just another homeless man dying, became a very personalized experience for them. And, I, and that taught me a lesson. So since that time, nobody says homeless or undomiciled to me. You know, house staff have a book. There are certain words they know you don't say to certain people. They don't say that to me. There are other words that they slip on and I catch them. But I have no problem putting together the two parts of my life. And that, I think, is a lesson because one of the sad things I've learned is that house staff, <coughs> students, are very idealistic in the first and second year. By the time they get to the third and fourth year of medical school, they've somehow become hardened. And I think they're hardened by what they hear from residents and also from attendings. I think a lot of the attendings I've heard say, I, I'm glad my kids are not going into medicine, or this is terrible, or researchers saying, the NIH standards are so hard you can't get it, you know, whatever. I don't think we're giving to our students the message that medicine is a very exciting, rewarding, wonderful field. And why not? Because I don't think we're self we're not haven't been turned on about it. And so one of the things I've done is to try to alert my colleagues to just what a wonderful life they have. And they shouldn't only focus the terrible thing that happened last week or the way the school was botching this up or that, but that overall, it's a very wonderful, rich life. I feel that way, and I think many of them do, but they don't necessarily transmit it. So we started this program on humanistic medicine. I wrote this book. I was asked to speak about it at, at Yale. And uh, I said, I can talk about humanistic medicine and the midnight meal, but I would rather come, I'll give the talk, I would rather bring some faculty who run our sessions and give you a fishbowl demonstration. Give me eight students around the table, I'll bring a facilitator, and you can see what we do. They thought that was great. So at Yale, we ran sessions for their primary care people, for their general medicine people, and they were spectacularly successful. We did the same thing at Case Western the next year, and then I was asked to, uh, to present this at uh, University College of London. I couldn't bring a couple of facilitators across uh, to London, so I'm, I had a video made. And the way we did the video was after endless amounts of consent and inform informed consent with the students, a video maker came in and sat in on these weekly sessions. So she sat in with the, for the first three sessions, just uh, like a fly on the wall, didn't say a word. By the fourth session, 
<coughs> she brought in a video camera and a sound system and filmed the next three one-hour sessions. So she had 180 minutes of, of tape. She boiled it down to 18 minutes. And I want to show you one segment, about eight minutes of that. Uh, the, the facilitator is an extraordinary woman who I could talk about forever, but you'll see how good she is. I just alert you that what we did was we videotaped it, and then we went back and had her comment on what the action was. So you'll see her wearing two different color sweaters, a black sweater and a yellow sweater. That's just filmed at two different times. So she said, the responses of medical students and house staff offices confronting death, suffering, and grief should be examined and acknowledged as a part of their educational experience. So I'm going to show this video, and I'm not going to say anything afterwards. I can't say anything after Elspeth Couch. She's that good. But I'll, I hope we'll have a couple of minutes for some questions. Have any of you had to deal with uh, the family of someone who died or who has taken a terribly bad turn for the worse? Have any of you had to do it or have you witnessed it? Yeah, I was just happened to be watching a surgery with a woman who is um, 23, I'm 24, and she was um, getting a hysterectomy because there was a war, uh, cervical cancer and they opened her up and they saw mets in her abdomen, which basically end of story. So they didn't remove her uterus and um, she woke up from the operation and was like, how'd it go? And everyone in the room was just like, and nobody wanted to say anything. It was really awful. And I went back and, um, I mean, I don't know how I got myself involved in it, but um, I went back and I got, I was with the family and I had to get special permission so they could come into the OR and the nurse was yelling at me and how could the family be there? And, and um, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty bad. But you were right in there pitching and it didn't paralyze you. You see, that's the thing. The student was horrified, absolutely horrified, and frightened and shocked beyond belief. Still with you, right after all this time. Don't be ashamed of it. Do you feel that as doctors you're not supposed to have any, uh, you know, that you're not supposed to cry? You're a human being. People say, the student broke down, the family broke down. She did nothing of the sort. She cried. Crying is not a, a, a defect in a BMW that broke down on the road. It is a natural response to a very strong feeling. Do you think it's unprofessional that she's crying? Who's that? No, no, not at all. You had a reaction to it and the right reaction to it, and that makes you human. That's only going to make you better position in the end, because if you remain human, then, then I, I don't know how to say it. I mean, it just that seems like the most important thing. But if you can still do your job in light of that, that's, that's a good doctor. The other student who commented on the death of his patient, that just happened. You could see the trembling in his lips. Yeah, I was following him for like a week. And his it was pretty sad when I found out. I don't know if anybody expected it to happen this quickly. I just found out this morning when I was following up on the patient, that's when I found out that he had expired. And also it is death, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it's not yeah. just a turn for the worse. Was this the first time that, uh, that there was a patient that you actually knew well who died? Yeah. Maybe there are also others that and you can help each other out a bit in talking what, what this is really, uh, what this means to you as a budding doctor. Um, we'd had all met his patient. He looked really sick, and so, but he wasn't even on our team, he was on, on his team. But when we found out, we were all, you know, sort of, I mean, I was more deeply affected than I thought I would be, and, you know, not even knowing this person at all. I don't know what an appropriate uh, way of dealing with that is. I think it's important, you know, to unpack what your own reactions really were so that you, we don't have to jump so fast dealing appropriately, whatever, you know, whatever that may mean. I, you know, I thought about it, it was on my mind. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so, I mean, still lives in my mind. So, you know, once he meets someone, I think it's, once I meet someone, I, you know, I, even, I mean, I, maybe I only asked him one or two questions when we met, but it's kind of hard to wipe the impression of someone away from your mind just like that. And especially, I don't know, I just, I find, I, this is completely off the topic, but I find the use of the word expired to be really sort of offensive to me. Mm. I don't know, it just kind of depersonalizes them. What's wrong with he died? He died sounds like too... It didn't sound professional enough, right? Well, it's the real. Well, no, not because unprofessional. It just sounds too. I don't know. Too harsh. Harder, I guess, for me to deal with than anything else. The closest I ever came to anything like this was uh, in pediatrics. I had a child, a little baby, who was like a couple. Of, maybe she was like a, a couple of months, maybe even a year old, and she had this uh, very, very rare syndrome, which combined a lot of different things together and she was essentially blind and deaf and uh, she had to come in because she couldn't breathe very well and it was really just a shame because she was just in this little tent for oxygen she didn't know what the world was you know the only world to her was what he was touching so the only thing I would do every day was uh, touch her legs and I would just sort of like rub her belly a little bit and apparently she used to they found that if you did a little something to her side she would sort of give a smile and if that kid passed away I think I would be very upset but I would also think that that, was, that that might also be for the best. I don't know, but uh, a child who's been essentially robbed of all, of all the senses, except for touch, and will never know or hear or see whatever's going on, and whose life might not, I don't know if I'm to say, you know, what kind of life they would live if they made it up to a certain age at all, but, uh, you know, just to save them the heartache of having to go on. Or... This is a huge topic, right, that you've now opened up, a huge topic. And you said, you know, who am I, so to speak, you know, to make such a decision. Mm -hmm. But this is a very, very big issue, yet another one, right? I think we have to end today on the note that, that you are living with these huge existential questions to which there's no right or wrong answer except to really be sure of what your own perceptions and feelings and your technical knowledge are. And don't be fearful, as you were saying, to reach for some understanding and connection with other people, whether it's your team, whether it's home, whatever it is, because that's how we comfort each other. Reaching out for such understanding, connection and support is not a sign of weakness and self-indulgence. It just acknowledges the professional responsibility of doctors to find ways of sustaining themselves in their profoundly challenging work over many, many years of practice if they hope to remain competent, ethical and caring physicians. Ignoring this could mean courting burnout. A, a few questions for, for Dr. Lowenstein. Yes, please. What would be your um, recommendations if we wanted to start something like this here? And what is most important in terms of uh, planning? And how did you um, basically get students to a place where they felt like they were really in a protected space? I think I was fortunate. I had three things <clears throat> that allowed this to happen. First, I, um, we had just started a firm system. We divided the Department of Medicine into th six different groups. The idea was it would allow in small groups to pilot projects. So this was a pilot project. The second thing is I had enough status uh, myself so I could go to the chief of medicine and say, I'd like to start this. And he put it on the curriculum for the daily activities of the medical students. Uh, the chief of medicine for several years <clears throat> found money here or there to pay the facilitators and eventually a member of the Board of Trustees endowed the program. So we were on the curriculum, we had uh, adequate financial support, and we had a person who was willing to take, you know, to be at hundreds of sessions, and I was. I think if you can find that combination, I think you, you may need all three, but I think it's worth looking, and 
I had no idea that this was going to evolve. Arthur. So I enjoyed that very much as well, so thank you so much. You know, one of the things that strikes me from my own career and listening to you <coughs> is um, the mentorship and continuity of interaction of students or house staff with some attending or some more senior person over a long period of time, if that person conveys the right kind of humanistic qualities, has a huge impact. And one of the challenges I think we have today is all these interactions between students and house staff and attendings are so short and so quick because of a whole variety of things that this ability to interact with them and show narrative medicine and how you react is something we should try to find a way to reinstall into the curriculum or experiences uh, so that one has a better chance to learn from one's uh, special I, I agree, and, and the, the shortened work day and the shifting and the coming and going, most of our students don't know who their teachers are. Uh, but I think it's possible to, to modify the system in such a way that there is for each student, one person, or each small group of students, one, conti one person who achieves a, a level of continuity. And I think we have to be inventive and creative to, to find that. But I, I agree with you completely. The shifting... Of, of who's the teacher and who's the... It just doesn't work. You need role models. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lowenstein.